slowly learning. Okay. Now we're live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're coffee. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm gonna also bring up the live on my phone so I can track everyone's comments as they're happening so people can also tune in. Live. Oh, let's see, I'm muted. On my phone, so I can track. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, one thing really, I also need to bring it up on that. Sometimes technology is great, sometimes technology is awful. <laughs> um, okay. A few more names, and we'll wait for a few people. And this is muted. And perfect. Okay, someone says hi. Okay, we're live. <laughs> um, great. So first of all, um, thank you so so much, Ms. Ardan Roy, for joining us. Um, for everyone tuning in, welcome to Because We've Read, a radical international book club here to challenge the way that you um, understand the world and your place within it. Um, this unit, we've been reading um, everything Ardan Roy, but specifically her book, The End of Imagination. Um, which is a collection of a lot of her writing um, um, over the years, and it is unfortunately or fortunately just very still relevant today. And um, along with several of her links and articles um, that she's been publishing around on the interwebs. And yes, we also are so thrilled and honored um, and so excited to have Arden Roy herself join us for YouTube Live, our conversation. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. You're so welcome. <laughs> um, also, for everyone tuning in, I think the reception might be a little bit iffy, um, but I think that both of us are recording it on our side. So once this is uploaded as a podcast, all of the sound, all of the everything will be perfect. Um, so yes, I'm so so excited, and I know that we only have an hour, so I'm just gonna dive right in. That's okay. Um, and also, I encourage everybody who's listening to jump in the conversation at any moment, um, ask questions, because we really want to make this conversation as accessible as possible, um, and also as relevant to your work um, as organizers, as students, as young people, old people, just around the world. So first and foremost, uh, you started out as an architect, which I think is amazing, but also so visible in your writing. Like the way, like the poetry and arts um, of the way that you write, it, it's like you're designing and constructing like buildings, you know, it, it's like rooted and um, architecturally and structurally sound, but still aesthetic and like has this poetry to it. Um, so what did this transition for you from architecture to writing look like? And what role, if any, does like aesthetic play in your writing? Well, uh, you know, actually, when I started, when I, I mean, I grew up in a small town, in a small village really, and then in a small town in, South India, and then when my mother runs a school, still runs a school there, and there was an extraordinary architect who actually started to build the school. She had no money, and he used to call it no cost. The word the word he used was no cost architecture, you know, not low cost. And I was very, uh, I was very, very impressed by the fact that you could design things so beautifully with so little money. But the reason I joined architecture was I knew that, you know, I somehow sensed that the kind of person that I was, I was not going to be able to be allowed to breathe three breaths continuously unless I was financially independent. You know, I had to, I had to leave home and I needed to study something which I could start sort of earning my living almost immediately with. And so I joined architecture also for those reasons. Although once I joined, I was so uh, fascinated by it. Before I joined, it did seem to me that the only thing I, I would ever be was a writer. But when I joined architecture, uh, you know, for five years, we just drew, hardly ever wrote. But, but in my final year, I actually argued and argued and argued about the fact that I wanted to do a written thesis not a drawn thesis, you know, not a design thesis. And my thesis was about the city and how it came to be, what it is, and so on. And I uh, feel like 
you know, when people ask me, why did you change from architecture to writing? I do often say, no, I didn't change. I still practice architecture. You know, <laughs> it's what I do. <clears throat> That's amazing. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's very clear that the way that you write has it's very influenced by art um, and aesthetic. I, I thought, uh, and of course, the opposite was true too. That while I was studying architecture, I was becoming more and more, uh, you know, to me, it became more and more difficult to answer these questions of about design and why we design things in certain ways and what happened to architecture in India. You know, how has history and colonialism and all that affected the way we think about design, about cities. So it's also the other way, the, the political way of thinking began to uh, to kind of affect the way I thought about design and, and the other way too. So it was, uh, I mean, it's never been, uh, I've never been somebody who, who believes in these, uh, these borders between things, you know. I just think uh, you, you have to use everything you know to, to do something as beautifully as you can. <laughs> I love that. And I think that that train is definitely very clear throughout all of your writing. Um, and we'll get to that in a second, too. Um, someone actually mentioned on that point, you literally have an architectural structure made of books behind you. <laughs> yeah. Although I don't take credit for it, because this is my friend's uh, room. Uh, it's not my house, but, but, but the books part is there in my house, too. <laughs> We would expect to know that. Um, <laughs> and on like this, because you do kind of have a different, um, I think, approach to writing, um, but you also, I mean, also live in traditions of many people. So who do you consider your work to be within the legacy of, or what? whose tradition do you feel like you belong to? Nobody's. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult to ask that question you know because because of the fact that my uh, influences come from so many different streams you know so if I'm if my influences of writing come from I mean this is not to say that I've not learned from people I'm not saying that at all uh, you know but let's say you 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 may you may be deeply influenced I was anyway by from an early age by 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 I suppose one of the great white imperialists, Mr. Kipling, you know. I love the way he's the one I do it. <laughs> you know, one 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 can eat uh, chew gum and walk at the same time. So, you know, he might have been horrible politics, but there was something in that craft. I was so deeply influenced by a particular dance form in Kerala called Kadakali, you know, where the telling of the story was so confident, you know, like uh, on the back of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, it says how to tell a shattered story by slowly becoming everybody. No, by slowly becoming everything. I learned that from them, from, from the dance form, actually, more than from a, a, a literary form, you know. So in some ways, that was a, a, a tradition. I mean, can you claim that a novel belongs to a dance form? I don't know, <laughs> you know. In some way. So, so yeah. So, so it was, you know, there, there's so many things that that uh, that are not just literary that 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 make me think or write the way I do. Mm. I love that. Um, I actually ask that question every time I interview somebody, and a lot of people have actually said you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just I I'm I'm I mean I, as I say you know there are so many people who write like I mean for instance people like let's say Tony Morris now as you mentioned Angela Davis or Naomi or Noam Chomsky or so many other people you know but I'm just talking about the form and the way I think yeah exactly so, <laughs> it is very from from things which are uh, like I have to think about, you know, yeah. even language. I have, you know, like I, I write about how do you write in what language? I mean, I wrote I wrote a, an essay recently called "In What Language Does Rain Fall Over Tormented Cities," which is a quote mm -hmm. from Neruda. But in India, now the question of language is so complicated. You know, the, the 
there are so many languages and so how do you find a language beyond the language which is still ours you know so nothing can be taken for granted you know? definitely yeah there's like a million things that i can like ask in response to that but <laughs> we'll have to keep moving forward um yeah, actually, on that note, so then before we move on, someone asks, um, Ramya Madhavan asks, what does it mean to you to be writing in English then? Well, uh, this is exactly what the, this, this essay that I wrote called In What Language Does Rain Fall Over Tormented Cities? It's about uh, what language you write in, in India. And say, in the last, uh, in my first novel, The God of Small Things was a book that was imagined in two languages and Malayalam, which is spoken in, in the South. And this new novel, The Ministry of Atmos Happiness, it, it's a, 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 a book imagined in so many several languages. So there isn't any one morally appropriate language to write in. You know? So in any moment, in India, you're moving to Hindi. You say in Delhi, you're moving to Hindi and English, sometimes even in a single sentence. None of the characters in the Ministry of Atmos Happiness actually speak the same language. So they're all translating to each other and from each other. And I actually just worked. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. The book is translated into 51 languages now. Wow. And here I just work with you and Hindi translations that just came out. So, you know, uh, anyway, that's a very complicated subject. And I think. If the questioner reads that essay, mm -hmm. it's on the internet. <laughs> Get it well, a long time. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, and one of the things that I also, one of the things that I respect probably the most about you and value so much is that you're very principled, right? So you don't just like write about corporate power. You're on the streets um, protesting. You're meeting with organizers, and you're also like turning down speaking engagements um, and platforms endorsed and sponsored by those companies themselves that are you're, you're writing about and critiquing. Um, and obviously, like this sounds like it's logical. Like if you write against the corporation, you shouldn't go to events sponsored by them. But like in a world of celebrity culture and everything so essentialized, you know, we're we're really um, something that you write about is like we really siloed ourselves. So we think. Oh yeah, you can like support Muslims and like not think about all of the different ways that you're still committing violence against Muslims, for example, um, and everything sort of become very simplistic and you know, etc. But you stand your ground, um, and that's something well, that's you know, at, the same very time, at the same time. You know, uh, it's so difficult to actually be so pure and moral, you know, because these corporations have now kind of laid siege to us. So you know, you might be. Uh, I mean, it's impossible to to be completely principled about it. Exactly. <laughs> I don't go to a literary festival, maybe supported by a certain mining company, but you know, those same companies, you might have to have your internet internet connection because they own everything. They own the internet, they own fabrics, they own petrochemicals, they own the wireless, they own telecommunication, they own university. You know, so my point is that I'm trying to make a point and sometimes, you know, here too, we come from the land of Gandhi, where this sort of pure moral positions also are very annoying. And, you know, they sort of, <laughs> oh, unless you go party and don't have sex and don't shop, then you can't be political, you know? So you're sort of bludgeoned by this kind of uh, very in, uh, implacable morality, you know? What is you can't be pure, really. Can't be, you know. So, Definitely. and I'm not. <laughs> it's like a and I'm not. <laughs> um, you pre answered it, but, um, and yes, to that point, exactly. There's no way that anyone can be perfectly, like, exempt from all of these. Like, the, we all pay taxes, you know, and paid yeah. taxes. Yeah. Um, and paid Starting from that, and you pay taxes. You write an essay called The End of Imagination Against Nuclear Weapons. You pay taxes, and then those, that money goes into building those weapons. You know. So. <laughs> yeah, and to, to reference um, one page in the book um, of End of Imagination, you write that on page sixty-eight. So, as a citizen, I am forced to acknowledge that I am somehow made complicit in the Gujarat pogrom. It is this that outrages me. 
And so you, you talk about your also your complicity as someone who's a citizen, as someone who still like exists in this world today. So like, where do you draw that line? Um, and how do each of us ourselves, how can we come to that decision of where we should be drawing that line in our own lives? See, I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a question of instinct, you know, like where do you draw it and how do you draw it? It's a very interesting thing that you mentioned the Gujarat pogrom, you know, in 2002, uh, uh, in a, in this so, supposedly the world's greatest democracy and so largest or whatever yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know so 2000 people are slaughtered on the streets women are burnt killed and the 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 person who was the chief minister of that state at that time i mean whether he was complicit or whether he just was the chief you know that's a separate matter but the point is that he has never apologized or never taken responsibility for that and went on to become prime minister but between 2002 and 2014 which was when the campaign for him to be prime minister happened so many liberals so many people decided to forgive him for that right and now you know with five years of a person like that at the helm of the country the people who did not feel outraged that somebody actually uh, was was the head of a state where this massacre was taking place. They have to find different regions to outrage now, you know, because they allowed that. That was, that was allowed to happen. And that was forgiven uh, by, by these people. And so you see how often liberals can prepare the ground for something terrible. Definitely. And that actually kind of leads to the second point as well in that right now, um, as you mentioned, India is also kind of elections are coming up right now. Um, and I think this line for me is also specifically interesting when we talk about electoral politics. Um, and of course, every political context is different given that people are not just in one place right now listening to this. Um, but what do you sort of see as the role of internet electoral politics um, and that work with inherent, like inherently and structurally violent institutions. So, for example, to again ground it in the book, you write that, um, quote, putting a couple of well-known social activists into parliament is interesting, but not really politically meaningful. Not a process worth challenging all of our energies into. And I think this is really interesting um, and something that I've also, I think, personally fiercely been passionate about, like I, electoral politics are not gonna save us. But I think right now, and I've, we'd be really interested to hear what's happening in India and if your perspectives have changed. But in the United States, I think there might be a little bit of a shift. For example, like Ilhan, Ilhan Omar, her comments about Israel, sure, there's been like decades of Palestine solidarity organizers working on getting that shift over, but there seems to be maybe a glimmer of hope or is it just like an, an, an animality and like we kind oh, there of- is a, There is a glimmer of hope and uh, you know, I would not today say that there's no difference between this radical uh, fundamentalist Hindu right wing that's in power and the other parties. I would not say that there is no difference. However, I would not say that if they were voted out of office, that things are going to change drastically. And the the thing that's worrying is, you know, that you are entering this. We are entering this era of authoritarian politics and as you know majoritarianism can easily shade into the action and the and really the the reasons for why we came to this place in the first place is, is so if if you just look at what people call secular liberal intellectualism they speak quite passionately against what we call communal politics you know, when they say everyone should love each other and then Muslims and everyone should live in peace. But they, those same people, will not criticize the growth of corporate power, the growth of a, a country with economic policies that have caused nine people to own the combined wealth of 500 million people, and will not concede the growth of communalism rooted in that country 
sort of way of, 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 of taking people's rage and directing it in other ways. You know? So you actually think of justice in all sorts of ways, whether it's gender, whether it's economic. You, you do have to, and that's why I, I sometimes think only novelists really have the, the gall to do that, you know, to say, how are all these things connected? You know, because they are connected, and you can't just choose which patch of uh, the meadow you want to campaign for justice on. You have to, you can, but you have to at least see the whole picture. You know, mm, definitely. So, have to and so, if we are going to go back to a place where people are talking about, uh, you know, secularism, but we must privatize more. We must corporatize more. You have a situation in India where, obviously, you know what is more or less opaque to the outside world is the caste system, and caste is the engine that runs modern India. You know, so uh, for example, now you know for 50, 60 years you had uh, you know a public education system, however bad it was, and you had a system what we call that we call reservation, what is affirmative action, which over the last 70 years has given people who belong to the quote unquote untouchable castes like Dalits or indigenous people a foothold in the system. And now privatizing education pushes them all out all over again. So it's a form of feudalism that's coming back but with a different name. And you can't just be talking only about communal harmony, not about economic justice. You know? So uh, that's why it becomes extremely complicated. I mean, if you were here, um, I, I often, you know, like people ask me to write about elections, and I'm like, I don't know how to explain to someone outside because you go to a place and they will just tell you, you know, there are all these different castes, these are their loyalties, this is how it's going to, it would just be like completely opaque to somebody you know, outside. And then once the elections are over, everyone will pretend that, oh, we are such a modern society, we have overcome caste, we are moving into the computer. Age. That's just bullshit. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that, like, that also creates a sort of, um, in a sense, a question of like, where do we move forward? And I think organizers, especially like they're, because obviously everyone has limited capacities. So like how much, how much do people engage in a system that is inherently violent? Like how much is, because we also, like, do you feel like we also need people within? Should we have progressive, actual leftist people running for positions of power or should it be more? Yeah. I think, I think uh, you know, it's, sorry, I, I, I'm just going to say that although like recently the, the other sort of big national party, the Congress party, came out with a manifesto, I mean, there are big debates about whether that manifesto is completely utopian or not. I certainly believe that even if it's utopian, that utopia needs to be examined as a utopia. And you can see so clearly the influence of so many years of activism by so many kinds of social movements that have produced that document certainly that uh, that makes a difference you know so i again you know i'd say that if you if you look at a situation where social movements are all told that you mean nothing you go to stand for election you know that elections is a big money game. You're going to lose, but that doesn't mean that you do not have. I think it's a stupid thing for people to think that they can play on the big stage when all the dust is loaded against them. You know, but to not stand for elections doesn't mean you don't have moral authority. It doesn't mean what you're doing is meaningless. I think it's I, one of the really frightening things is the attempt to kill social movements and turn them all into electoral democracies. Whereas right now, 
the relationship between them is very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Udu right is just uh, trying to shut them down. Everybody's in jail. Everybody's an anti-national. Everybody is, uh, you know, being either lynched or beaten or murdered or jail. You know, although now there's a sudden window of hope because it looks as though um, it looks as though you know this this very very the this this country of so many years and castes and so on very brutal very hierarchical very difficult to uh, bring to heel though you know because it's so complicated in its uh, breakup. Definitely. And again, that also looks very different in like every different like society. I think that relationship in which what yeah. possibly ever be effective. Um, someone asks on that note, do you think Modi will win the election? <laughs> well, honestly, I don't think he will. I mean, he'll win personally his election, but I don't think he'll go back to power as the prime minister. Um, and OK. The rest of these are related to the next part of the question. So something else that I also think that um, is so, so powerful in your work, and that's your, your really your writing to, to work to de-silo movement spaces, meaning that um, your very strong efforts to show that literally everything is connected. If you care about dams, you care about the environment, you have to care about war. If you care about war, you have to care about caste. You know, all of these things that people like to just be like, oh yeah, I'm just to care about the environment um, and not bring in racial politics, class, and all these things. So I think, this work right now, uh, personally, I feel like is probably one of the most in important types of work to be doing right now, um, but also very difficult to kind of navigate. Um, so how do you suggest that this work begins for organizers or non-organizers listening? So if, if you're all right now active in movement spaces or you're just like an individual like trying to navigate your life? <laughs> well, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm terrible at giving advice, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Like I, I, I try to. Um, I think that the reason that I, uh, I, I began to write the way I write and the way, and it began to accumulate into this text, is because I am, uh, in my deepest DNA, storyteller. You know, so I just think all the essays are basically stories, and when you tell stories you don't have subject headings you know you, you're not you're not trying to become an expert who just hoards a certain part of the expertise for yourself but you actually you actually can range over these subjects and also because of uh, you know the combination of traveling talking to people being a novelist uh, you know, and yet being up against so much all the time that you do have to be very rigorous, you know, otherwise you just get flattened. So uh, it was a very odd combination of things that made me, I mean, uh, I, I often talk about this when, when, I'm, when I'm talking about my, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, that to me, the radical understanding can only come when you tell how how caste and Kashmir and gender and economics and the environment. Like when you're walking through a city, if you just see a shoe shine boy or a guard or a barber or a cigarette seller, then you don't know anything. But these people are human beings who've come to the city on this great tide of what is going on in this country. You know? And everyone has a story, and that story weaves into the next and the next and the next. So I approach my nonfiction as a novelist would, and I approach my novels without the skillfulness of, oh, it should be some personal story about something, and we mustn't be political. But I feel like, uh, you know, what, what you need to do is to be able to look at love and intimacy and war and politics and 
irrigation and you know displacement with the same tender eye. Mm. That was very beautifully put. <laughs> um, I think also on this note, one thing that um, oftentimes I feel like one issue in particular that really gets sort of pushed away to the wayside that you also write about is Kashmir. Um, and I do want to take time to talk about, especially recently, what's been happening in Kashmir. And we also have a question here that says, um, how do different political and social movements within India and Pakistan feel about Kashmir's future? And what do Kashmiris actually want? Well, you see, the thing is that nobody seems to want to know what Kashmiris actually want. Although, you know, they've been pretty clear about what they actually want. But I'm talking about in a formal sense, you know. Uh, the idea is to both India and Pakistan don't seem to be very concerned about what Kashmiris actually want. But the problem is that now, since 1947, the situation has come the stage where, uh, I mean, India, like Israel, has great, a great tradition of statecraft, of a presence in the world that is, is, is sort of based on a kind of uh, exceptionalism different from the US, but why they ought not to be questioned about anything. But now the, the thing is that you had a situation where past governments had created all kinds of, uh, you know, a middle ground, a pretend elections, a sort of, uh, a sort of uh, over overlay of something that looked remotely like democracy, even though there was there was a military occupation underneath that. But now, this new set of people in power who don't have a history of understanding statecraft, of understanding how intelligence uh, and uh, military intelligence and all these people have worked to create this, these, these figures that pretend to be democratic. They've, so since they have no understanding, they have burned it all away. And you have a direct confrontation now between populations and the army and militants, you know. So that is what has led to India and Pakistan now becoming the first ever nuclear powers to bomb each other. By doing that, they have internationalized Kashmir because now what happens there affects the whole world because, you know, you just cannot look away from the fact that here, for, ex for example, you have media channels, 400 media channels, most of whom are, are spewing this kind of hatred and nationalism and rights, lifting up a whole nation into a frenzy. How are you going to control things? You know, if things go out of hand, if there's another attack as there was in February, how a, a country is going to election? No, how, how, I mean, things are being picked up in a way that is so mindless, there's no way of controlling it, there's no way of um, backing off. So the world had better pay attention to, to that very small place, because as you know, very small places can change. Um, and what sort of, like, how, how do you in, see, like, other people then engaging with this issue of Kashmir? So people in Canada, people in the United States, people, like, across Europe or Africa, how can people actually engage or understand better what's happening in the situation um, in order to, to, in a way, de-silo this as well? You know, like, you don't have to be in India or Pakistan in order to care about Kashmir or have its relation to, like, your work. Just have to. I mean, people just have to first look at a map and find out where Kashmir is. Start us for start, and then you know, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things available to be read, and a lot of Kashmir books on the internet, and so on. But you know, first understanding of history. But I think uh, you know, it's not just people, but it's also institutions in the world, 
even the discredited ones, you know, that need to turn their attention to Kashmir. Even things like the Red Cross or the UN or whoever it is needs to start asking some serious questions. Of course, as you know, both India and Pakistan, especially India, is one of the greatest purchasers of weapons now. So, and as you know, the, the Western economy uh, runs on on on, uh, on uh, selling weapons. So, it is in everybody's interest to keep this warlike situation alive. But are they sure that they can control it after what happened and and, and after the fact that now once again there's massive re recruitment you know, towards militancy of young Kashmiri. I, I think uh, they might need to put their commercial interests aside for a bit and want worry about the fate of the earth. Mm. Um sort of related on this note, a question that just came up um, is, do you think a pan-South Asian state would be feasible, one more loosely associated than current India, so there's more regional autonomy, but also it overcomes partition? I think, you see, I think, uh, I think it's feasible because I think, you know, uh, when you build a, a huge sort of palatial monument on quicksand, Quicksand is a quicksand of, of kind of manufactured hatred. It's surprisingly easy for it to also collapse, you know, for people to say, hey, come on, you know. And there's actually so much that is common between India and Pakistan. And you could actually see that instead of Kashmir being a nuclear flashpoint, it could be a buffer zone. It could be the key to a great prosperity as well, you know, easily. So I don't think it's impossible at all. Mm. Um, someone also asks, how does India and Iran relation, like how does the relationship between India and Iran affect the situation? I'm assuming in Kashmir is what they're referring to. Well, I guess, the, the relationship between India and Iran, as in, actually, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm loosely saying these words like India and Iran, but I don't know what they even mean. Like, I don't know. I don't think in terms of these countries, uh, you know, how we talk about the government of India and the government of Iran, okay? So there has been a very old relationship, but now obviously it's mediated through the, the, the United States to some extent, you know? But uh, uh, it's 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 really it's really odd. I mean, you have a government which see everyone should understand that the government of uh, the BJP and Modi they belong to this organization called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh. It was set up. It, it was uh, born in 1925, and it believes and has always believed that India should be a Hindu nation, that all minorities should be a second-class citizens. It has always advocated the removal of the Indian constitution. Uh, it, 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 it actually is very interesting because India, in, in, a, in a sense, is a land of minorities. Because this idea of who is a Hindu is a very contentious thing. People used to only think of themselves as belonging to particular castes, you know, and it is caste to which they owe their allegiance. It is caste which is the arithmetic when elections come about. So to try and make a majority out of, or to create a political majority out of this land of minorities is what this uh, RSS tries to do, and Modi and most of his ministers, all of them are members of the RSS, which is a non-political cultural guild but which is the most powerful yeah non-political as in it doesn't have election but it controls the bjp and it will decide it can decide who the prime minister has to be who the home minister has to be it is the most powerful organization in this country you know so uh it it's it's just it's just it's just a 
uh, it's just a situation where you're in you're in a lot of trouble because you're you're actually being run by something that isn't really openly visible but is controlling everything. Mm. Yeah. Um, and on the topic of Iran, a little bit like so shifting a, a little bit. Um, I was just in Iran two or three weeks ago. Um, and seeing people there, especially suffering under sanctions that have been so like horribly devastating to the people of Iran, um, but also just talking to young Iranians who own businesses, who own shops, and it seemed that every direction that seems like progress was toward capitalism. And every time anybody was like, oh, wait, when sanctions are lifted, we want to move towards this direction. And it was always sort of this accumulation of wealth and like industry. Um, but I've also like with people that I've spoken to in like countries across the Middle East and Africa, Think particularly like quote unquote developing countries, um, progress always seems to look like capitalism. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about and struggling with this idea of what does progress look like that isn't capitalism? Well, you know, right now I think uh, I would say that in the next 30 years, the world is going to change in ways that we, we have not been able to anticipate, you know? So, all the people who want to progress towards capitalism should look at what the societies that are in late capitalism look like, not the Scandinavian countries that I'm talking about, the US or England or now look at India. You know, you have, as I said, nine people that own the wealth of 500 million people. So is that where you want to go? And the, 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 the stress on the, the I mean, we don't want to use the word resources, but for lack of a better word, you know, the destruction that uh, involves this model is something that's so. So, to answer your question, what is a what does it look like when it's not capitalism? I would say that one of the one of the things we have to come to terms with now is the fact that because of automation, because of uh, AI and because of a lot of things that are going to happen very quickly, unlike during the Industrial Revolution, it took time, but now it's going to happen. It's already happening that you are seeing a, a kind of growth, economic growth without job. You are going to see the vast section of human society is not going to be past participating in economic activity. Now, the Nazis used to call them surplus. And you know what they try to do. But there's another way of looking at it, a utopian way of looking at it. That could be could it be that human beings will be will be freed from the burden of labor? But if they were, then how and who would look after them? They, I mean, how would they be freed to do other more beautiful things that they really wanted to do. So you 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 are you are actually we are actually looking at a radical I can't use the word welfare because that has a charitable angle to it. But I'm saying that there has to be we will have to be looking at a situation what a person has is not necessarily what they labor for because they may not be any you know? And what do you do? How, the right to education, the right to a living wage, the right to everything else. Basic minimum demand. Revolution comes after that. But that is not in place of revolution. Because right now you're looking at people just starving, malnutrition, hunger. People who can't think of anything beyond just surviving, you know. So I would say that uh, I mean one of the big things being debated here now, this new manifesto that the Congress Party has come up with, uh, and I know that it came in consultation with people like Piketty and so on, is the promise of a basic living wage to the bottom twenty percent of the population, you know. And there is this huge outrage from the middle class and from the media. Where is this money going to come from? How can it how can it be done? And when just 
like two months ago, the Supreme Court ordered that 20, like 200,000, no, 2 million, 200,000 uh, indigenous people be, be evicted with immediate effect from the forests in which they live, i.e. they be stripped of everything they have. Nobody had a problem. But if you think about when was that? Just, you know, just two months ago, oh, wow. you know, uh, and now, but when you think of, if you say that, oh, the money to give the poorest people in this country a living wage could maybe come from taxing very slightly, very rich people, it's like, oh, how can that happen? Like, how could that be done? That's just like the heavens have fallen. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to, uh, we have to, I think, start thinking about, uh, you know, capitalism when people in developing or underdeveloped or whatever the world class societies think about capitalism. You know, they probably just think about restaurants and jobs and food and, you know, good times, but that's not what it is. So now it's, it's those, those, those days of that kind of capitalism are over. So we're going to have to look at some model of a welfare state. Mm -hmm. So, and it, so, uh, some of your more recent writing also so has touched upon this concept of AI and like this, like the, this direction that we're heading in, in terms of technology. Are these the sorts of questions that you're really thinking about right now? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, over here you range. Uh, as I keep saying, India lives in several centuries simultaneously. You know, so. You simultaneously think of AI and uh, female feticide or, you know, some deep uh, mining in the forest where the gorilla balls are going. You know, it's like everything is happening all at once. One question. <laughs> <laughs> Always yeah. everything, of course, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. 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 I forgot for a second who I was speaking to. Um, very, very on character. <laughs> um, so one of my last questions just to wrap things up um, is that your writing is so deeply emotional. Um, there's oftentimes like tones of like a, a sober somberness or like a passionate devastation. Um, but the beauty of your writing makes it so that I never actually feel overwhelmed when I read it, like with reality. Um, but so how do you stay hopeful if you are hopeful? <laughs> what drives you? <laughs> well, one of my uh, one of my books, which was one of the collections of my essays, was dedicated to those who learn to divorce hope from reading. You know? <laughs> so so I think hope actually is disconnected to reason. If we were all reasonable people, we might be more hopeless and pathetic than we actually are. And okay, that kind of I, <laughs> no, I just think that, you know, ultimately uh, when you when you when you're when you're uh, when you're thinking clearly and when you I mean let's say when you have the the enemy if you like because I think and sometimes there are enemies, you know, we do have enemies. I do write against something and someone a lot. And when you have them in your gun sights, you know that, look, you have to do what you have to do and you go down. Uh, you, if you go down, you go down, but you don't want to be on their side, you know. So then the question of hopeful or not hopeful doesn't arise. Like, you are doing what you have to do and you carry on and it's, it's a I think there's a partly there's also a sense of someone asked me once how are you like hopeful after all the things you write I said that's like asking a ant who's trying to cross a highway whether they're depressed about the traffic <laughs> like you know whatever <laughs> you you just have to do what you do like it's not as though you're being hopeful not hopeful 
playing this thing. I don't know. There's a sense in which I just feel, uh, even when I write, especially when I write the nonfiction, there's a sense I have of I only write when I can't contain it in my body. You know, mm -hmm. so I just I just have to write it. Otherwise, I can't settle down. I can't sit. I can't sleep. So I just write it, and then you know take the consequences. But uh, this, there's, there's so many beautiful things that happen to me. You know, there's such, uh, there's such poetry, there's such beauty, there's such love around us too. You know, which would be a great pity to forget about. After all, if we didn't love something and we weren't protecting the things we love and the landscapes we love and the people that we love, then why would we be fighting so fiercely? I love that. That's so beautiful. <laughs> We also have two dogs, which I'm sure also helps. Yes, I do. <laughs> I have two in the house and then others spread out in rings around the city. <laughs> I'm not a dog person, so that's terrifying. Uh, <laughs> the very last question, which is probably the most important out of all the questions, why aren't you on social media? We can't tag you anything. I feel like you'd have a killer Instagram account. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm i sort of uh, mixed about it because, you know, when I was writing my novel, I really wanted to sort of be uh, be with the characters in my book and be alone inside my head. And sometimes I feel like in the social media, you barely know what you're thinking and what the other person is thinking and who is where and what. And it's like <laughs> a book. Uh, so that's why. And also... You know, I, I, I just sometimes I just like not knowing everything all the time. And, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I wish I was sometimes and then I just don't know whether I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> Although to be but fair, if you're on social media, you'll probably know less about the world um, than you do now about well, the nonsense. Yeah, but um, oh. no, I mean, it's, it's just a personal thing, you know. Sometimes <laughs> Also here, the, the amount of hatred and trolling and all this that you have to put up with. It's like now no one knows where to send it. <laughs> so the Instagram account, Ara underscore Roy underscore official underscore ID is not. <laughs> it's not me. It's not me. Let the record show. <laughs> you have many what? fans. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, but no, thank you so much. Uh, for this really oh, wonderful inspiring, energizing um, conversation. I really appreciate all that you do. Um, and thank you to everybody in the comments and questions section. Um, a lot of people were just saying, I love her, my favorite writer, love from, you know, they're, they're sending you love. So I wasn't necessarily. Oh, tell them, thank you. <laughs> she said thank you. <laughs> um, but right, I'm going to end the live here. But thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, and yes, thank you so much again, Ms. Arudanti Roy, for joining us for this conversation. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.